That is the simple reason why Ukraine doesn't want any ceasefire anymore, because we know how it ends. Let me ask you first of all, Richard, as far as Russia is concerned, with so much at stake in the current circumstances, how is peace to be obtained? Because you seem to give the impression that the only way to get peace was to dismantle capitalism. But that doesn't seem to be an immediate way of dealing with the situation in Ukraine. Well, my first reaction is to say that it is probably true that a transition from capitalism to something better that we've leaded for a long time has never been an immediately available option. So we have never pursued it as such. And we've therefore had one war after another. So maybe the immediate solution is really not what we ought to be looking at. We can find and make immediate adjustments, but the effect of the immediate adjustments we've made in the past has hardly been to bring us peace. But what, it's the what, point the last speaker made that peace is simp not simply the absence of war. Peace, if it's going to mean anything, has got to have in it a recognition and an attention to the underlying forces of it. Otherwise, we're left with nostrums like it's better to have more weapons than less. Really? That's a guarantee for peace, to have more weapons than less? We have that here in the United States. We are a society that has more weapons per person than any place else on Earth. We don't have peace. We have the most violent domestic politics imaginable as well as an armaments beyond words for global warfare. We didn't bring peace to anyone by this strategy. But you, you, you made that uh, point previously, Richard, powerfully. But what do you think, in the current circumstances, uh, should be done to advance peace in the context of the Russia-Ukraine conflict? Are you saying that the, uh, uh, the West should not be supporting Ukraine at all? There should be no weapons provided to Ukraine? What, what do you think should be actually done? Well, we had two conflicting interests there. We had the anxiety of the West about what the Russians might do, and we had the anxiety of the Russians about what the West was likely to do. They had been maneuvering against one another, as was correctly said earlier, for many years, militarily in the Donbass, in the area nearest the Russian border, and politically and otherwise, in all the usual intelligence as well, maneuvering that we know goes on. So the issue for me, and I think a reasonable way to approach it, is to say, before you get to the point of the threat of the basic interests of these two sides, that you sit down, which was done early in the conflict back in February, to try to come up with some solution that might address the needs of both sides so there is no war, rather than proceed crossing each other, you know, red lines, as they like to call them, and then pro one side provokes the other. And then to retreat into saying who exactly provoked who, when, with what date, and, uh, really, that's childish. The issue is what are the fundamental concerns and those have to be put on the table with a demand that they be worked out without military recourse. Okay, I, I'm still, I'm afraid, not quite sure whether you think that there should, in the, in the interim of coming to an agreement, a, a, a diplomatic agreement with Russia, you think there should be support for Ukraine. But let's turn to Svetlana. What, what do you think about that? Uh, diplomatic, as it were, solution to peace? Uh, first of all, Russia, even now, they don't want to negotiate, and they repeated a lot of times that they're, go they're going to have peace talks only on their terms, meaning that uh, the occupied parts of Ukraine that are right, are right now under Russian control, that we, the, they will remain Russian, that Ukraine will have to give up Crimea, east of Ukraine, the Parisian region, but not only that, that Ukraine should never become a NATO member, and all of the other demands that Russia has. And when 
we are talking about the negotiations between the West and Russia, I don't see there Ukraine. I mean, the war is fought in Ukraine and I feel like we are not included at all. Like it, it sounds like everything has to be decided over us, that they will reach some kind of agreement and but what will happen to Ukrainian people who are living in <coughs> occupation, who are scared to leave their houses because their women can be raped, that the kids that can't learn their language, what happened to all of those people if those lands remained Russian? So my answer for that is Ukraine has to receive uh, the military and financial support to win the war in a military way. If it is not enough, uh, to win the war, if we receive not enough, like now, Ukraine at least have to be in the better position before negotiations. It has to have certain leverage to talk with Russia. For example, if we receive long-range missiles and we uh, seize Russian army in Crimea and uh, destroy the care bridge, then we can talk with Russia about something or we destroy their fleet because right now, both sides won't negotiate because Russia, of course, won't leave Ukraine's lands and Ukraine won't give up its territories and its people. So, Richard, you, you're, you're not taking into account the interests of the Ukrainians in suggesting a negotiation between uh, the West and Russia. Of course I am. That, that's the kind of debate that it goes nowhere, finger pointing, it's your fault. No, it's your fault. It's childish. Of course, Ukraine's interest is in my mind. The horror of the war that is being fought mostly on their territory is self-evident. They are suffering unspeakably, and they should not have. And the responsibility for that is largely distributed all across the participants, Ukrainians, Russians, Americans, British, and fill in the blank. They all have a responsibility, all of them to participate in a negotiated settlement that takes into account the, the needs, the genuine needs of the Ukrainian people, the Russian people, and the Western countries that have inserted themselves into this arrangement. Well, they may, they may all have a responsibility, but Svetlana's point is that the Russians aren't going to take that responsibility, then they're not going to take into account the interests of the Ukrainians. And what do you do? What do you propose? that you do in a situation where one party is simply not prepared to take into account the interests of the other. Well, we don't read the history the same. The Russians feel that they have not had their security interests taken seriously by the NATO powers, by the United States and Britain that guaranteed them certain protections with the end of the Cold War, etc. I'm not here to negotiate or to arbitrate among these different perspectives. But I don't think it gets us one step closer to peace to spend our time deciding who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. This stuff happens in every war. And mostly what it does is obscure the underlying productions of this. Why did NATO move to the east? Why was that a useful thing to do in the interests of world peace? That's just as important as what happened in the Donbass over the last eight years. All of those things are reflections of underlying social processes. Here's the irony. We didn't have a war in Europe, by and large, during the Cold War. But as soon as the Cold War was over, guess what? We began a series of processes ending up in the Ukraine war. We have to understand why that happened rather than getting lost in the specifics that it was Ukraine rather than country X or country Y. Having a large country invade and take over a small country, that's not new. That's not uniquely Russian. It's got nothing to do with it. I'm a citizen of a country that is very large and very powerful and very rich. Our lovely history over the last 30, 40 years has been to invade the poor backward country of Korea, the poor backward country of Vietnam, of Iraq, of Afghanistan. I mean, I could go on, but we are not having big discussions on who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. We want to take a step back and ask how and why do these things keep happening? 
rather than getting all up on a bizarre soap box to tell us who's in the right and who's in the wrong on this latest version of a very old story. David. I think we've got to come back to the position we're in now, where the aggressor, in my view, Russia, uh, after all, President Putin is on record. He said, Ukraine is a sovereign, independent nation state, and it will choose its own path to peace and security. <laughs> Those were not words he kept to. Um, but we're in a position where the aggressor, Russia, has, is showing no signs whatever of recognizing the mistakes that have been made in its uh, military operation, uh, of recognizing the humanitarian catastrophe that it's creating, of recognizing it is not fighting this war according to humanitarian law principles. So you can argue as much as you like with Moscow. There is no sign at the moment that their losses are sufficient to uh, cause a change of heart. The, the victim, the immediate victim, there is no sign that the Ukrainian people are prepared to throw in the towel and say, we give up, uh, we will surrender to uh, Moscow's demands. So that's the position we've actually got to start with. And at some point, something will change. I don't know what it will be, whether it will be in Moscow, uh, whether it will be on the battlefield. And then settlement talks can begin. I would personally be very unhappy to see simply calls for a ceasefire. Because all that does is give both parties the chance to, take their, uh, to catch their breath, to rearm, and the war will start again. What President Putin has very publicly said is that Ukraine cannot be, now he has now said Ukraine and cannot be an independent state. It is part of the Russian Empire. Until that mindset changes, this war is not going to end. So you were advocating, therefore, the support of the West for military uh, arms to Ukraine. Are there any limits to that? How, how much uh, arms does the, does the West uh, provide? And Coming back to our big overall theme, is, is the provision of military defense the way to gain peace? Is that, in the end, is, it going to be, is peace only going to be obtained by having sufficient uh, military force on one side to deter the other, which is Svetlana's point? The collapse of Ukraine <laughs> under Russian pressure is not, will not result in what I would describe as peace with justice. Therefore, it follows that Ukraine must be enabled to continue to resist. Uh, uh, so does that mean there's no limit no, to the amount of weapons? No, it doesn't. Weapons? Any more than that uh, we say, uh, we take the Russian view, there's no limit in the atrocities we can commit. We have to operate under international humanitarian law, and there are restrictions there. And we have to look after, if you like, the interests of our own people, which is why acting in a way that could lead to escalation with Russia, a full-out war between NATO and Russia would be a catastrophe. So we have to take steps to minimize that risk, and that's very uncomfortable for our Ukrainian friends, because it means that, for example, limitations are placed on long-range weapons that might be supplied that cannot be used to attack Russia itself in case that is misunderstood. So this is a nasty, uncomfortable position for everyone. Okay. I, but we, I, just to for, pick out one point Richard made, it is possible to draw a very different history from that that Richard briefly outlined. And you won't want me to do it here because we haven't got the time. But I just urge people, just don't jump to the conclusion that, for example, uh, NATO taking in new members, which is, it was entirely 
legitimate for NATO to accept new members. Those new members want to join the European Union where they haven't already joined it. Was that something to be denied them? Because Russia felt that somehow this was to expand the zone of European uh, civilization. And Putin himself has declared himself an enemy of Europe. And he wishes to resist uh, uh, what he would see as European influence inside Russia. Now, I find all this almost incomprehensible when I hear Putin talk about and read what he says. But that is the truth. That's where we currently are. But let me simply comment, since I'm astonished too, at the argument that we ought not to have a ceasefire because it would give time to the two sides, each of them to arm some more, etc. That's always true. That has always been true. It has been the context of every ceasefire negotiated. And for every example that a ceasefire was used to arm further, there's an example in which a ceasefire was the first step into ending a war and conflict. It's if you don't want to end the war and conflict that you lopsidedly suggest that the ceasefire could have negative consequences. It's always true with any proposition that it could have negative consequences. I wouldn't deny that that's possible. But for you or anyone to suggest that we oughtn't to explore a ceasefire surrounded by the normal qualifications that go with ceasefires, reject that out of hand while people are dying on the streets of Ukraine, strikes me as a remarkable unwillingness to deal with the basic issues, because in fact, we are lost in our conflicting notions of what the history was that reinforces the argument that it's the underlying historical forces that we ought to be addressing rather than getting lost in the quid pro quo. But that's because, very simply, that is because in the historical cases you would cite, the ceasefire was the first step to a settlement. As I've been trying to explain, at the moment we do not have the conditions which allow, would allow for a proper settlement. And therefore, that's why simply having a ceasefire to try temporarily to halt the bloodshed is not, I think, the answer. I would like to add just one thing. We had a ceasefire with, ceasefire with Russia for eight years that the West pushed us into. And for all of these years, when the West was thinking there is peace in Ukraine, our soldiers kept dying because Russia didn't keep the promises of not keep, of, of keep of keeping the ceasefire uh, people civilians kept dying they just gathered more weapons and came and invaded us again that is the simple reason why ukraine doesn't want any ceasefire anymore because we know how it ends okay uh, uh, but, let, let's let's move on to to a next uh, uh, overall theme in trying to address the question of how we pursue peace, and that's to look at the nuclear deterrent in general. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.